Hey, what's up guys? Brad with Squared Away Every Day, and today we are gonna be taking a look at my Tesla Model X Plaid, the 1,000 plus horsepower Tesla that is a crossover and also seats six people. An interesting vehicle. I've owned it for about seven months at this point, put about 7,000 miles on it, and today I'm gonna be giving you my honest review. If you like this kind of content, please go ahead and give me a like, give me a sub, and let's hop into it. All right, so for starters, let's talk about the styling and the aesthetics of the vehicle. Go ahead and ignore the camo wrap I have on my particular plaid. This is something that does not come stock. It's not an option from Tesla. Mine just came in a gloss black configuration. But as far as the aesthetics go, this is not my favorite looking vehicle. It honestly is, I call it my minivan, and it kind of is. It seats six people, it's got kind of a, a bubbly shape to it, like all the Teslas do, to be fair, but this particular one does look like a Tesla minivan, if there ever was such a thing. And so, really, it doesn't have that great of aesthetics, in my personal opinion. I think from the back, left, or right kind of corners of the vehicle, it looks nice, but it's never a vehicle that was just overly handsome to me or anything like that. Although I would say it's not ugly, it's just not a great looking vehicle. All right, so let's start in the front of the vehicle just in terms of what the Tesla has to offer. And I'd like to start with the headlights. The headlights on really any of the Teslas with the Matrix headlights are very, very good. It puts out a wall of light like no other vehicle I've ever driven. And I come from the overland world where exterior lighting is a thing. And this has some of the best exterior lighting that I've ever seen. It probably is the best out of all the vehicles I've ever owned. Now, the cool thing with the headlights on this particular vehicle too is as you start to turn to the left, your um, there will be exterior lights on the left side of the headlight that illuminate the left side. And as you start to turn to the right, there will be additional lights that light up on the right side. This is all internal inside of the actual headlight assembly. And so as you start to make a turn, it gives just a little bit more light when you're going left or right around a corner. Now, when we talk about the ground clearance of the vehicle, this by far, hands down, has the best clearance of any of the Teslas and really that's just because of the air suspension that this particular vehicle has. Now, when it's riding at its normal height, it's just ever so slightly taller than a Tesla Model Y or a Tesla Model Y Performance. When you raise it up to the high or very high configuration, which those are limited to uh, speed limit restrictions. So on the very high, I believe you can't go faster than 15 miles per hour. On the 35, or I'm sorry, on the high, you can't go over 35 miles per hour. So generally speaking, you're riding at a medium height just all the time if you want that extra ground clearance. And so uh, for go getting over obstacles like frozen snow or maybe just rocks if you're on like a dirt trail, like a particularly bumpy road with a bunch of pits and divots and stuff like that, this, this is a good option. Um, but you can't be driving around all the time at the high or very high variant. And of course, the frunk. We can't not talk about the frunk being up in front of the vehicle here. The frunks get a ton of coverage, and to be honest with you, I don't really use the frunk. It's not something that's overly easy to use. There's no sort of external latch or buttons or anything like that to get into the frunk. You actually have to get your phone out, get into the app, click into controls, and then you can open up the front. So it's not something where you can carry around gear particularly easy. However, I do think it's good for holding stuff like air compressors or things that you really are gonna ride around with all the time. And I say air compressor because, well, these vehicles don't have any sort of spare tire. So that would be something good to put in the front, something that you're just not using overly often, but you do wanna take along on the ride. So the front, as you can see, it's not power assist or anything like that. It's just kind of a basic, um, hydraulic strut and that's really all you're working with on the frunk. All right, so here we are at the wheels and tires and there's two different variants you can get from Tesla. This is the 20 inch variant with the all season tire and that's how the 20 inchers come and that's probably, you know, limited to supply chain and stuff like that. But generally speaking, the all season tire is supposed to be coming on the 20 inch and then they have a 22 inch model which comes with a performance tire. I'm not exactly sure what one that is but it does come with a performance tire. So me, I opted for the 20 inch and that's because I've seen a lot of things online with the Model X's specifically. Anytime you start to go above 20 inch, I see people complaining that they, they get a lot of blowouts on the road and stuff like that. And that's well pretty simple because you're riding on a 22 inch wheel with very little rubber on a 6,000 plus pound vehicle. And you can see the car is freaking out. It's thinking I'm here and thinking I'm walking away. But either way, 
Um, the tires are pretty important. The wheel is even more important. And just make sure, I personally, I would recommend going with the 20 inch just because I haven't had any problems with blowouts or anything like that. And you do want a significant amount of rubber so that you can cushion the blow of the 6,000 plus pound vehicle as you're going over bumps and dips and stuff like that in the road. All right, on the back side of the vehicle, taillights are pretty standard, nothing too crazy or anything like that. The more updated version, which this is the refreshed version, obviously, because it's a plaid, but the more updated version doesn't have this little black trim uh, coming into the, the tail lights there. I think that's kind of a bummer because it does look more like a Model Y or a Model 3, and it's already really difficult for people to tell the difference between any of the Teslas anyway because they do look very similar to just the layman who doesn't really know anything about Teslas. Now, the tail lights are very good. They're bright enough, all that stuff. I have no complaints as far as that goes, and they look relatively good, being that they have a black background to the, head, to the tail light themselves. <clears throat> And then we've got this spoiler here, and the spoiler on the old versions actually used to go down and up. It was like an active arrow spoiler that you could actually control. These ones, it's now just a fixed piece. There's no, there's nothing you can really do with it. So it's just a fixed piece. You can't move that up and down whatsoever. Then on the back side, we also have the auto tailgate or hatch. And I don't know why I called it a tailgate. It's a hatch. And the auto hatch is relatively nice. Nothing to write home about. It can open. It can also close with one hand. And that's pretty nice if you just have stuff in your hands as you're getting in and out of the vehicle and just kind of going to and fro. So as we open this up, you will see we've got a relatively small compartment back here for just anything that you need to put in there. So your cargo space is relatively limited if you need to actually seat a lot of people in here. So you've got two seats in the front, two seats in the middle of the vehicle, which are your captain's chairs, which are electric. We'll follow those in a second. And then you've got your third row seats, which I've got the headrests down because the visibility can be relatively bad inside of the vehicle with those headrests up. So the way I like to roll is with the headrests down. I do like to have these seats up and there's a reason for that. Now, I don't ever use the third row. Why would I need the third row seats up? Well, specifically because the third row seats are kind of holding in all of the stuff inside of your vehicle. So let's take a closer look. All right, now one nice thing that Tesla does give you is, I'll take my camera stuff out of here is you've got this little flap, this hatch here, which is relatively nice. Although I will say it does kind of come out. It feels a little bit cheap and I feel like they could have executed that a little bit better in terms of how this whole flap system works. But inside there's a little cavity and you can store your stuff inside. Then we've got the actual seats that do go down. So you hold a little button on the top left or top right. You push the seat down and you do that on both sides. They don't come up so easily. We'll follow that in one second. But as you can see, there's a open cavity, a crevasse in the middle of the seats there. And so all of your stuff that you put on this little platform here, when you put the seats down, just goes flying forward. So you really gotta drive pretty gingerly when you've got stuff in the back and the seats are down right there. And it's just because all your crap can go flying forward, which is really a downside. And honestly, something that was super irritating to me owning this vehicle the entire time. That's probably one of my least favorite things is that on the Tesla Model X Plaid specifically, you can only get the six seater variant, which means you have this gap when you are using this space for cargo in the back. Now, let me show you what it looks like to go ahead and get the seats back up. It's actually a pain in the butt. You have to actually get inside of the vehicle, hold the button down and then pull it back. And you do that on both sides. And it's just a pain in the butt. So the X and the X Plaid do come with a tow hitch, although it's kind of hidden down here. So it actually comes with a separate tow hitch assembly, which you need to actually put into the actual vehicle. So you take off this plastic piece right here, and then you can put on your tow hitch, and then you can't put the plastic piece back. So it does look a little bit out of place. I prefer the Model Y style, where the hitch is already in place, and you can just cover it up with the plastic piece, or you can leave it open. Me, personally, when I'm going on like bike rides with the family and stuff like that and I put the bike carrier into the vehicle, I just popped a little plastic piece out and then I put it back in. So it just keeps this nice, clean, good aesthetic. I don't really use the tow hitch on this particular vehicle because I don't really want to be having to install the tow hitch or take the plastic piece off, install the hot, the, <laughs> hot hitch, the tow hitch, and then 
take the tow hitch off when I'm done using it and then put the plastic piece back on just for it to look good. So if I were to use it or if I needed it, I would just leave that plastic piece off and leave the tow hitch installed all the time, which would make the vehicle look not as good aesthetically. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the performance, the claim to fame for the Plaid series from Tesla. Now, if you don't follow the channel at all, um, I've owned the Model S Plaid, the Model Y Performance, the 3 Performance, and obviously now the X Plaid. And so I will say this, the X Plaid and the S Plaid feel similar in speed, although I will say the S Plaid does have a little bit more of a punch to it when you talk about the torque of the vehicle, and it feels ever so slightly faster. To somebody that's only ridden in the vehicle, either one of them just a handful of times, I don't think you'd really be able to tell the difference one way or the other, but I will say, it is a very quick vehicle. It feels very, very fast, just about as fast as the S Plaid. Now the S Plaid, I took that to the drag strip uh, several times, and I also took this to the drag strip, and I will say in terms of the torque stability of the vehicle, not just on the drag strip, but just driving around town, the X obviously because of its center of gravity and just being a bigger vehicle overall, doesn't have the same kind of torque stability that the Model S does. So the Model S, like I would trust anybody, even if they weren't really a driver, to take it down the track going 150 miles an hour plus, and I wouldn't really feel nervous about it. This car, I probably wouldn't feel too nervous about it, but I wouldn't be just jumping at the opportunity to let anybody drive this down the drag strip, because I will say, once you pass that, I don't know, 120 mile an hour, um, point, which most people will never do that, but once you pass about 120 miles per hour, it's not as stable as the S is. And so that's just its high speed stability. And then the torque stability, it's not as stable. Once the pull just slightly left or right, just slightly compared to the S Plaid, it's not a big deal. A normal person could drive the car. I leave this personal uh, Plaid of mine in Plaid all the time. It's always in sport steering or maybe it's in advanced. Um, but either way, it's an easy vehicle to drive for the most part. It's just not as stable on the torque end or on the high speed end as the S Plaid is going to be. Now, after owning the vehicle for seven months, seven-ish thousand miles, I will say the vehicle is still, it's a very easy, easy vehicle to drive. The maneuverability of it's very good. It's obviously not gonna be like a three or an S, but for the size of the vehicle, it's very, very easy to drive. Now the speed, believe it or not, is something that you do get used to. So that thousand horsepower you get used to after a little while and it's relatively sterile. And so it just becomes kind of a normal everyday car that you drive. It's not something personally for me where I'm always hammering down on the accelerator and that's just simply because because you're up way past the speed limit so incredibly fast, it's not something that I'm just doing all the time. And generally, I just, I don't really access the speed after owning owning it for a seven, uh, seven months, 7,000 miles. It's not like I'm always just mashing down on the gas, but not gas, the accelerator. Um, it's more so something that's just a very comfortable daily driver, and I access the speed when I need to for merging on the highway and that kind of stuff. Overall, would I say it's a fun vehicle? No, I, it's fun in the beginning, but after a while, you get used to it and it's just a very easy practical vehicle to drive and that's as far as I would go with the actual fun factor on the vehicle. All right, so expanding just a little bit on the driving and the handling and just the overall drivability of the vehicle, I will say this, the traction control systems on really all the Teslas, but specifically the ones with the three motors, the S Plaid and the X Plaid is very very good. It has something called torque vectoring where if you get a little, look into it, if you get a little bit of slip, it's kind of like a fancy slip uh, control is really what it is. But I will say this, on the S Plaid that I had and the X Plaid, and honestly on the 3 and the Y, if you're even in a little bit of wet conditions and you hammer it down, it is really difficult to get the vehicle to get squirrely and go sideways. It's just not something that really happens on the Tesla. So the traction control is second to none. So I will say in terms of the drivability to, on that standpoint, it is very, very good, which also lends well to just practical driving when we're talking about driving in inclement weather like snow or hail or ice or mud or anything like that. The vehicle is very, very good to drive. Now, when we talk about just general cruising, the X, Plaid, or probably just even the X would fall into this category, is the most comfortable vehicle I've ever driven. It's not the most comfortable in the sense that it is uh, very smooth and feels like an old Cadillac. It's not quite like that, although you can adjust the suspension to be more comfortable or be more sporty or whatever. It's not like that, but 
it's very comfortable in the sense that the interior of the cabin is very quiet. So all the external noises that you get are really are drowned out when you're inside of the car. It's not the quietest vehicle um, that you're ever gonna be in, but it is, it might actually. It's not gonna be um, kind of like into Rolls Royce territory or like a Bentley or something like that, but it is very, very quiet, which can also kind of be a negative. If you get any sort of rattling inside of the car, very, very tiny, something maybe you wouldn't notice in like, uh, you know, a truck or something like that, uh, you're gonna notice it in here and it's just because it's so quiet inside of the vehicle. So that lends to it being a very, uh, calm, peaceful drive when you're just cruising about and it's very comfortable to drive. Now the actual steering and the braking and the acceleration and the actual smoothness of the suspension is all very, very good as well, which lends to the vehicle being so easy to drive. And of course, you have the huge panel glass inside, which really lets you see everything on the road. So to me personally, the drivability of this particular vehicle for just every everyday general use is really, really good and it's super relaxing, so I like that. When we talk about the performance driving, it's just slightly better than um, than like, uh, you know, a normal X or like a normal Y. It's not a great performing car when you talk about its performance and its handling side of the, of the house, um, but it is good. It's not gonna lose control. I mean, you can take some corners going relatively quick, but it's a heavy vehicle, so you gotta be careful with that aspect of it. That's probably its only downside when it comes to the handling. Other than that, the engineering aspect, it's very, very good. I don't think they could have done any better when you talk about the handling of the vehicle. All right, everybody's been waiting for this one. Let's talk about what are the biggest selling points of the vehicle, and that is going to be the Falcon wing doors on on the Tessa. Now this is a very cool aspect of the vehicle. It looks awesome and honestly it's crazy just the way that it even does this. This door itself is like a hundred pounds so the fact that it even does this with such ease is very very impressive. Now when you go to buckle kiddos into this particular vehicle it's super easy because well everything's out of the way so you can just get in here buckle your kit in and voila it's pretty easy. That's very very nice. Now I will say the doors are very flashy so if you're just trying to go about your business and not really draw much attention this is not the car to do it in if you have people in that second or third row that need to be getting in and out of the vehicle now the falcon wing doors do have something called a low open mode where it just cranes just a little bit lower this is also good for inclement weather so that you're not getting a ton of rain or snow or whatever inside of the car when you're getting out because it is so open when you open the car fully. So you can do the low open, which is lower, but it's not that great when you talk about just not drawing attention to yourself. So very cool feature, but it is very flashy. So if you're into that, then yay for that. It's, it's awesome. Now when we talk about the doors up front, these are also auto doors and people like to just push these closed and always kind of, I, I always hate that just a little bit, but on the other side of it, well, we'll talk about it in a second here, but you can just push that and it'll auto close these doors. So for me personally, I'll show you how I kind of operate. The door opens, whatever. I get inside the vehicle. Now when I put my, my foot on the brake, it's going to close the door which is actually very nice. Now, this is the only thing for me that I get super irritated about with the auto doors is when I go to open it, I want to just get out of the vehicle and a lot of times it's fighting me and I don't like that. I just want to get out of the vehicle. I don't hit the button and then I just wait for the doors to just open for me. Granted, it only takes, as you saw, a couple of seconds there, but for me personally, when I'm getting out of the car, I just wanna get out of the car. I'm not like waiting for the door to open. It's just not something I'm used to. Even after seven months, 7,000 miles of using the vehicle, the auto door on the front gets kind of annoying and I will say this, it's a little bit hard to fight. Now, it's hard. It, what happens is when you start to push into the auto door, let's say there's like a trash can a little bit close or something like that, and you know that you're not gonna hit that, it will fight you It's actually pretty hard on destroying itself or denting itself against objects. So it's very good on that side of the house, but it also could be a little bit detrimental if you have the door set on auto, because you can also have it set when you walk up to the car, the doors will just automatically open. This can be a problem if you're parked on a street because of cars are going by, bicyclists, just pedestrians, things like that. The door can open up into oncoming traffic or people driving by or what have you. So that's kind of a problem. And I will say it can be a little bit difficult to keep the door from just pushing out into traffic or whatever. So. Uh, this has become kind of a love-hate thing for me. I love the aesthetic of the Falcon Wing door. However, it seems like to me personally, I'm constantly fighting the door, getting out of the vehicle, or sometimes the, um, 
I, I forget what it is, but sometimes little sensors on the outside do want to open a little bit fast and you have to kind of catch it. This is rare. You have to kind of catch it though. And it's really fighting you to like, and you're fighting the vehicle so that it doesn't just bash itself into something. So that's very rare that that happens. But for the most part, I'm fighting the vehicle getting out of it. It's going in, it's fine. You just put your foot on the brake, it closes, it's just wham, bam, you're like off. But it's getting out of the vehicle that's just a little bit annoying to me. It's something that I've grown tired of owning the vehicle. Seven months, 7,000 miles. That's just my personal opinion on it. Okay, so let's talk about the range on the vehicle. So generally speaking, I always charge the, the vehicle up to 90%. Whether I'm at a supercharger or I'm at the house, it's always a 90% charge. That's just what I do. Now the max range on the vehicle is 333 miles. I've done a video already on the range degradation I've experienced with this. I'll go ahead and link to it up here. But as far, as far as actual range goes from the factory, it's 333 miles, which is pretty accurate when you first get the vehicle. Now, me personally, the way that I drive it, I'm probably never really getting that 333. I'm probably getting on a max charge 100%, which I don't really do. But if I were to, I'm getting more like somewhere in the ballpark of maybe 290 miles of range. Now that's not bad. It's not like I ever have range anxiety with this thing. Majority of the time, I can just plug this in at home. I don't really need to use a supercharger all that often. So it hasn't been on a supercharger that much. I would say maybe 5% of the time, 10% of the time. It's been maybe not even 10%, probably 5% of the time. And you can hear the uh, door or the car thinking I'm here and then thinking I'm walking away and it's constantly it's opening and closing the actual side mirrors there. This is something that I'll just touch on now because it's happening all throughout the video is pretty annoying with the vehicle. Um, you walk up to the vehicle, you go to get in it and it doesn't know you're there and you have to kind of like mess with it a little bit and finally you get into the vehicle or you are walking away from the vehicle and sometimes it'll just um, unlock on you. And so it's kind of an annoying feature with the X is the auto unlock and auto lock feature. I haven't really had that problem on my S plaid, the Y performance or the three performance, but on this particular vehicle, it's super annoying. I don't know why it's so hard to get into the vehicle. It could just be something to do with this particular vehicle's sensor but it is something that's been kind of a, there it goes again, right there. It's been kind of uh, annoying to deal with to say the least. All right, so everybody knows the Teslas are just known for their tech. And I think something that actually gets overlooked a lot of times on the Tesla specifically, because there is an abundance of electric vehicles on the market these days is going to be the Tesla app. Now the Tesla app is really, really impressive. It can do a lot of different stuff. So it can do basic stuff like it can preheat your car. It can pre-cool your car. You can roll the windows down. You can roll the windows up. You can honk the horn. You can flash the lights. You can do all that kind of stuff on it, which is very, very good. But you can also do interesting things like if your kid is using the car, you can track the location of the vehicle. You can even see how fast they're driving while the car is in motion. And if it's actually got a trip planned, like they're going somewhere in particular, you can see where they're going, what time they'll be there, how fast they're moving. It's actually very, very in-depth in terms of what the app can actually do. Now, not only that, but the app itself can also do things like you can open up the, the front, you can open up the rear, uh, just basic stuff like that. But then you can also track your charging stats to see how much power you've put into the vehicle, how much it's cost you at the superchargers in the month. You can do other things like you can schedule roadside uh, assistance if you need that. You can actually schedule service appointments from the app and you can also buy upgrades from the app as well. As, uh, you can buy software and just like hard goods from the website from the app and it's just, it's very, very good in terms of, you can play music from it, you can do a lot of different stuff on the app to control your vehicle. And I think that's something that's really looked over in terms of just electric vehicles these days is the app integration. And the app integration on the Teslas is really second to none. It's super good. You can pretty much do anything you want to from the app. Now, my favorite thing hands down about the app is that it has something called sentry mode on the vehicle. Now there's cameras all over the vehicle. There's a internal cabin camera. There's, ca there's cameras on the front of the vehicle. There's cameras on the sides, on the right and the left side and there's also cameras on the back of the vehicle. Now, that's really cool because for a couple different reasons, for its full self-driving and its autopilot, which I don't use self-drive, I think the self-driving feature still has a lot of work to be done on it. I don't trust it. Um, and it's because in 
previous vehicles, I haven't had it with this, but the phantom braking was a big issue. Phantom braking, if you don't know, is the vehicle will be, will be driving down the highway and it'll just slam on the brakes down to like, maybe I'm going like 80 and it'll slam on the brakes and put me down to like 40. And so it was a safety hazard for me. I experienced that on my Model 3 and my Model Y. I haven't seen it on this X and I do use the autopilot, just testing it out sometimes or uh, different things like that. Now, where the autopilot shines is going to be specifically when you're driving down the road and let's say you drop your phone on the ground or you gotta hand something to one of your kids, it's great for that because you just put it on autopilot and you grab that real quick. It's great for stuff like that. Maybe you have to send just like a super quick text like, hey, I'll be there in a second. The autopilot is awesome for stuff like that. Now, in terms of me just driving around town with it, with the full self-drive, and I have had a Tesla with full self-drive, I don't think it's really that great, personally speaking. But the cameras are part of that integration into the full self-drive and the autopilot and all that good stuff, along with the sensors on the vehicle. But the cameras can be utilized inside of the app in the sense that you can get into something called sentry mode to where you can see, you can pull up on your phone remotely, you don't have to be with the vehicle, you can pull up the cameras uh, when you're out at dinner, if you're parked in a sketchy part of town or something like that. You can actually pull up the front camera, the rear camera, the side cameras, each side, and the interior cabin camera. Now you can't access the interior cabin camera if somebody's in the vehicle. If it senses somebody's in here, you cannot access it. But as long as the vehicle's parked and it's locked, then you can access sentry mode, which is a really interesting characteristic on the Teslas. All right, now real quick before we talk about the tech of the actual screen in the middle here and all that good stuff, something that's really interesting on the Teslas is something called regen braking. Now regen braking is very cool in the sense that you can be driving your vehicle, let off of the accelerator, and the vehicle will automatically start to slow down relative to how fast you're going, it's not just gonna slam on the brakes, but it'll automatically start to decrease in speed, which in effect charges your battery. So it's called regenerative braking. And so this is something with the Teslas that you can do something called one pedal driving. So you can literally just drive with the accelerator and you're pretty much just like feathering that accelerator to slow the car down when you're letting off the accelerator and speed the car up when you're pushing down. So effectively the, on the maintenance side of it, you really don't have to use your brakes all that often once you get used to the regenerative braking style of the car. Now it used to be that you could adjust the regenerative braking so that you could actually make the regen braking grab harder or just like soft or whatever you wanted or you could just turn it off entirely. These days you cannot turn it off entirely. It just is set to what it's set and I don't know why Tesla didn't want people messing with their regen braking settings but it's not something you can adjust anymore but it is a very interesting aspect of the vehicle. Okay so right here we've got kind of a first person view on what it looks like to be seated in the Tesla Model X Plaid. And so first off, you can see that we've got the uh, yoke here. And now, I, you know, I've made a bunch of different videos about this, but once again, I'll, I'll beat that same drum. I don't think it offers anything functionally speaking better than a wheel. Yes, you do get a little bit better, better visibility of this screen right here, but really was it ever that big of a deal with the traditional steering wheel? I don't think so personally. And I think that the length of it is just kind of long to where if your knees are you know kind of in the center of the vehicle not that i drive that way but it can just kind of brush up against stuff so me personally i prefer to have the wheel which is an option these days you don't necessarily have to have the yoke now the last thing i'll say about the yoke is i think it's silly that they put the horn as a button over here now you can hit it with your palm and it does kind of like da -da -da. it does like two or three little mini honks but you can't just like uh, hold it down um, with just your palm. You actually have to find it with your finger to hold that down. So you can just hit down like this and it'll go did -did -did. Even if you're holding down, it just goes did -did -did. You can't just go Err. and so I don't know. A bunch of different horn noises I just made. Long story short, why didn't they just put the horn right here? I think it was kind of a silly thing to do. And so me personally, I'm not super excited about the yoke. Now I do think it's very nice to use the blinkers on the yoke. I think that is uh, kind of a clever thing and it's easy to do and the car recognizes when you've made a lane change and it automatically turns off. I think that's awesome. But in terms of the actual functionality of the yoke, I just don't think it needs to be there. Now, this center screen here is very useful. It'll actually, like if we route somewhere, let's just say we route to, um, I can't close the door. We've got this camera set up over here. So we're gonna go ahead and forget that right this second. But long and the short of it, um, this screen provides a lot of information. It'll give you a little mini map when you're routed and it'll give you your speed and just all that stuff. Stuff that a normal gauge cluster would give you in a vehicle. It gives you the temperature, it gives you your range, gives you the time, 
all that good stuff. So that's all nice and something that people really like and sometimes don't like about the Model 3s and the Model Ys. So that's something there. Then we move over here to the actual center screen, and this is a very big screen, the biggest screen I've seen out of all three or all four Teslas I've owned. I think it might be the same size as the S, but I'm not entirely sure. Now, me personally, I like to drive with the rear camera always on, and it has the side cameras on. You can't see out this one because, the, well, the door is open, but I really like that. So as I'm driving down the road, I can really clearly see who's behind me, if somebody's right next to me. And these side cameras, I mean, if somebody's like right next to me, it shows it. And so it's not like there's any sort of lag or anything, which I really, really do like. Um, that's just an awesome aspect of the vehicle. Now, if we swipe down on this and we turn a blinker on, you can see that it go, it just pops up right here, my left blinker. Now, if we do the right blinker, the door is going to be in the way, but it shows the right. That is something really awesome that I do like. And this is not something that was on the Teslas a couple years ago, which is a nice aspect of owning a Tesla because you get these over the air software updates where it modernizes your vehicle, even if it's a few years old. So that's a really cool feature there. I do like that. The cameras in general is just really cool. And I like having all that visibility inside of the vehicle. So then we move down here. You've got just basic stuff. You've got your phone stuff. The Tesla, let me just say this. The Tesla uh, streaming service or like premium connectivity, whatever it is, is so incredibly good. Not only is the sound good, you've got speakers and little tweeters all over the car. The sound is very good inside of the X, but the sound, or I'm sorry, but the stations that they have, um, here's like all the Tesla's top stations and stuff and the genres that you can get into. And it's very extensive. Like if you go into classical and they've got a bunch of different types of classical music, maybe that wasn't a great example, but if you go into like metal, there's a bunch of, well, <laughs> I mean, there's not as many as I thought, but there is a lot of stations there. And I do think that, um, the functionality of the premium connectivity is definitely there. I appreciate it big time. And I really like being able to access just the on-demand music that comes with the Teslas. So I like the streaming. I like the premium connectivity. That's an awesome feature of the vehicles. And again, the sound inside of the vehicle is really, really good. Second to none, especially in the Tesla. Now, something we talked about earlier, I just want to touch on this real quick, is the pano glass. And so this is probably one of my favorite features of the car, just entirely. This is just awesome. I love the pano glass. You really do feel like you've got full control of the road. You can see everything and it's just open. And so it's awesome. It feels like you're in a Jetsons car or something. It really does feel like a futuristic car with the yoke and the uh, windshield. It just feels very futuristic. And so that is cool. And I do think the pano glass is functional. However, the tint stops right about here. And on very sunny days, the sun will kind of be like right here and man, it just blinds the crap out of you or it'll be like the perfect angle and it just really blinds you. So something I like to do is I tint the windshields on the Teslas just because there's so much glass. On this particular one, you're gonna wanna do ceramic because man, does it get hot in here. It's just like a little uh, greenhouse inside this vehicle with this panel glass. So it gets very, very hot. I do like having ceramic on here. And I also like to have it tinted just because it does get bright. And then this thing here, this is your uh, sun visor here. And the sun visor is very odd. The sun visor is actually pretty small. And then you've got your mirror here and that's all fine but really how you end up using your sun visor is you'll kind of find where the sun is at and then you just kind of like put it in front of the sun so like right here there's the sun right here you just kind of like put it right there <laughs> that's kind of how you use the sun visor inside of the model x so it does fold out of the way which is nice because when you don't need it you've got this huge piece of pano glass these pano glasses or i'm sorry the windshield is actually very difficult to wrap or not wrap, but to tint. And so not a lot of shops will do it. And it's generally kind of an expensive thing to do, but there are shops, people who have figured out how to do it. And I would definitely recommend it if you can do so. Now let's move back down here again and talk about just all the goodies and stuff. Now you've got your basic theater functions. So you can pull up uh, Netflix, Hulu, Disney, YouTube, you see all the apps, you can pull all this stuff up. And it's nice for if you've got some downtime and you're charging the vehicle, or if you've got your kiddos with you and they're just bored while you're charging or something like that, it's nice to have that. Or if you just need to burn time. Then you've also got the arcade to where you can do, um, you know, they've got the steam bait on here, which is cool. They've got 
all these different things. They've got fallout and like a racing game and you actually use the, the steering yoke or the wheel to actually steer the car on the racing game. So that's all cool, fun stuff there. And then they give you just silly things like, you know, there's like this fart thing and you can make it sound like it's farting from different parts of the vehicle. And you've got little music maker and little romance thing. Um, you've got a sketch pad you can just drive. You can put it so that the car looks like it's on Mars for the uh, GPS here. You can put it into Santa mode, which makes it look like on this particular screen, you're Santa driving around. Uh, I don't know. It's got some silly stuff. It's all fine. I don't really use any of this stuff, but it is there and it is a fun thing for people to have. Now, on the back screen, this is kind of nice. You can control what you want that back screen to be showing. So you can show <clears throat> um, Netflix, whatever, uh, while the vehicle is being driven on the back screen, not on the screen, you can't do that while the vehicle is being driven. You can show the music titles on the back screen. You can show the uh, climate controls, all that kind of stuff. So it's nice that you can lock that screen. So that if you have some kiddos that are just not very good listeners, you can go ahead and just lock them out or just put it on whatever you need to. So that's kind of a nice feature there. Um, and I think that's about it. Something that a lot of people like to look at and get a big kick out of is the uh, air. And so there's no actual air vents. Let's turn this down so it's not super loud. There's no actual air vents, but if we turn the air on for the driver, this is how you control it. You pull that up and down, you can split it, you can do a lot of different stuff with it. So that's how you control the air is from this screen. You don't actually control it anywhere else. So interesting to say the least. Now, some stuff that I like just living in Colorado specifically is you do have heated windshield wipers, which is awesome for the incle inclement weather that we see and when your windshields uh, wipers start to ice over and stuff like that. So it's nice for just keeping your visibility clear, which I do really like. Then you've got the heated steering yoke or wheel, whatever you've got, which is very nice. I like that. The, the material that they put on these is not overly durable on the yoke and the wheel I'm talking, but it is comfortable it's very comfortable but i've seen a lot of people you know just damaging these really bad on like you know a pocket knife or a watch or whatever and it just peels all the material off so it's not overly durable but it is very comfortable and then if we go back into the um just the hvac system here you've got all your different options obviously you've got heated seats you've got cooled seats You've, in the back, you can turn all the seats on for heat. You can adjust the heat and cool in the rear seats. And then a cool thing that a lot of people do really enjoy, and I do too, especially on hot days, is I like to keep the temperature. So it doesn't keep it quite what you put it at when you left, but it tries to keep it cool still, or it tries to keep it warm, which is really nice. And then if you go below 20% battery, it'll turn off. So the keep is very cool if it's a really hot day or a really cold day. And then we've got the dog mode, obviously. Dog mode, you can leave your dog in here, set the temp to whatever you need it to be. And then when you close the door, it'll say, you know, my dog's in here, my owner's coming back, please don't bash out the windows, something like that. And so dog mode's cool, and then camp mode's kind of the same thing. If you're sleeping in here, you can set the temperature to what you want it to be, and it'll stay at that temperature all the way down to 20% of the battery of the vehicle. Um, one last thing I want to mention is the bioweapon defense mode. And this is like if you're driving behind a diesel and they just do that freaking, you know, black cloud of smoke and exhaust on you. You can close off the vents to the outside world and it'll recirculate the air inside. It'll also take smells from the inside of the vehicle and put them out of the vehicle. So if you have your windows down and somebody's smoking a cigarette and it gets in your car and you want to just expel that, you can go ahead and do that. So pretty cool stuff. Um, the map is super easy to use on this particular vehicle, actually all the Teslas really. And so that's something that's relatively nice. And then you've got your just general, um, whatever you'd need to do on the car. So if I wanted to, I could open up one of the side doors. And if I wanted to, I could also close the side door. Oh, there it is. Now, if I wanted to, I'm not going to do it, but there's a camera right there. I could close the, the passenger door. I could open the driver door. I could do whatever I want to up here. You can open the charge ports. You can adjust the display. The display does tilt on um, the newer plaids. And so that's something that's kind of cool, not something that I generally use. And then obviously you've got your... Um, controls down here for your dash cam and your glove box because there is no button on the glove box. You just have to hit that button there. And that's pretty much it. Now, as we move down, you've got your pedals and steering. I, as said earlier, 
I always keep it in plaid. It, you can certainly do that. It's not like it's gonna damage the vehicle. Um, I keep it in sport mode as well, all the time in terms of the steering. And you can kind of just go down and adjust the vehicle however you want. Currently, right this second, it's set to high, um, but it's only gonna be up to, uh, it's only gonna be high up to 35 miles per hour. And then always you're gonna be driving at medium or low. Generally, you're not gonna go down to very low. Um, and then you can decide, what do you wanna do? Auto, comfort, sport, or advanced? You can pick all that kind of stuff. You can get into your charge features, your locks, your lights, your display the navigation, all this stuff right here, which is nice stuff to have. So needless to say, the tech in the Teslas is very, very good. And it's something that, um, I don't know, I think gets overlooked when you're talking about competitors like the Rivians and the Lucids and stuff like that. The tech in the Teslas is very fluid. It's very easy to use. And I think it gets a little bit overlooked when everybody's comparing electric vehicles. Everybody's talking about range and everybody's talking about horsepower, but really the usability and the drivability of these vehicles, really let's just call it the livability of these vehicles really boils down to the app integration coupled with just the tech inside of the center screen and how everything's laid out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the interior cabin of the vehicle. It does feel much bigger in this vehicle compared to my Y performance. It feels much bigger. There's a lot more room back here. Like I said, I call it my minivan. You got this big channel right here that goes into the back seat. So super functional if you do have people that are using those that third row back there. Now the seats here, like I said, they're heated, they're cooled, and they're actually very comfortable seats. The bolsters on the sides here are pretty intense. So you really can't sit kind of off kilter in the seat. It really does force you to sit in the middle of the seat, which is fine, but the seats are comfortable generally speaking. And the interior of the cabin is nice. The, the build materials are pretty nice. I wouldn't say it's like insane, but I would say they're pretty nice. So over here, you've got this little pocket here. I've got alcohol wipes and gum and stuff like that, but you can close it here and then you can also close it up all the way. The drink holders, as I've said in other videos, are a little bit small in the front. Um, something that kind of bugs me, but there is another cup holder right here, which you can obviously see I've got a drink in right there. Now, um, when we open this up all the way, let's pull this out. Um, you've got a big cavity in here with some USB-C ports, which is awesome. And I really like that. And so uh, that's been pretty nice just in terms of uh, using the vehicle on kind of a day-to-day basis, especially if you need to charge like an iPad or something like that. So you can close these pretty easy. In here, you've got just more, um, you know, just space to put all your stuff and your crap. We've got some wireless QI chargers right here. These are actually very, very fast. Sometimes on other vehicles I've had, you'll plug it in or you'll put it on a QI charger. And if your phone's dead, it'll take like an hour, an hour and a half to even turn it back on. This is pretty good. If it's at a complete dead uh, state of charge, you can put it on and it pretty much will turn on within like, I don't know, I would say maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So the QI chargers are really, really nice. Let's get out of the vehicle and step into the back of the vehicle here. And in the back, we're going to enter through this side. Got the Falcon wing doors. Once again, those are fine. And in the back, it's fine. Uh, a full-size adult like myself can sit in the back. You've got your little screen back here so that you can adjust anything that you would want to adjust. You can watch Netflix or, um, you know, adjust the music back here. All that stuff is just fine. Uh, the third row seat is a little bit tiny for somebody like me, but it does have cup holders back here. And it also has USB-C ports, which is awesome. So that's pretty nice. And that's pretty much it in the back. Now with the plaid specifically, you are going to get a carbon fiber uh, trim package inside of these. I don't think you can get that in just the long ranges anymore. I think you used to be able to but that's pretty much it for the interior cabin of the vehicle. All right, so before I give my final thoughts and opinions on the vehicle, let's just talk about the maintenance and also the resale value of these vehicles. How well do they retain value? And I will say this on the maintenance side of it, pretty much with any Tesla you're gonna own, the maintenance is pretty much non-existent. You need to make sure that it's got good tires on it, it's got windshield wiper fluid, and that's pretty much it. Now, stuff that I like to do to go a little bit above and beyond in terms of just like my own general responsibility of driving the vehicle, 
vehicle is I do like to have an air compressor, a tire repair kit in the vehicle because they don't carry a spare. But that's all I would really like to touch on in terms of the maintenance in general. These vehicles are generally very reliable and you don't really have to do much to them in terms of general maintenance other than, like I said, just the tires, maybe tire rotations left to right on most of them and then, or on the performance ones anyway, and then just making sure you got windshield wiper fluid. That's pretty much it. And even some of the, if you do have to have some weird stuff pop up that's like small and minor, they'll come out to your house many times and just fix your vehicle in your own garage or in your driveway. Now, one of the things that I have not been pleased with on the X specifically, and this is something I didn't really know about before buying the vehicle. Now, as we all know, 2020, 2021, used vehicle prices were insane. But prior to that, the Xs don't really hold value all that great. And even more so now with Tesla, um, they had relatively high prices on their X's and their S's. And then they've been throttling back on the sticker price of the vehicles, which has really caused the prices of these vehicles to just plummet. So there's a lot of people that are just really upside down on these vehicles. They have not held value overly well. I know this isn't a popular opinion, but it's just the data is that Tesla didn't tell everybody, hey, we've spiked the prices and then we're gonna lower them soon. What they said was, hey, our goal is to make sure that we can have the cheapest, uh, the cheapest vehicle possible and we will lower the prices in the future. However, I think they should have done it at a little bit more gradual pace just to make sure that they didn't burn all their customers who purchased, let's say, $145,000 or $155,000 uh, Tesla Model X, and then uh, the sticker price drops down to maybe $115,000 or $125,000. I think they could have done it a little bit slower. So in terms of the actual um, resale value of these vehicles, in 2020, 2021, it was very, very good. But I will say because of uh, Tesla's aggressive business tactics, which I think is a good thing for the longevity of their business, um, it can kind of put you in the lurch. It's like, I hope I buy the Tesla at a good time because it could also be the opposite to where maybe we have uh, more labor constraints or we have supply chain issues again at some point in the future and prices jump up. And so it's always kind of this thing to where you're wondering like, am I getting a really good deal on the Tesla and also, in a week or two weeks or a month or a year, is there gonna be some insane improvement to the vehicle that's really going to make this vehicle far less desirable and it, is it going to be worth that much less just because of the insane new features tesla's not a company to where they do like a 23 model has all this and a 24 model has all this they just kind of release new features as they're ready to do it and so it's kind of hard to game in terms of uh are you getting are you going to be buying a vehicle that is going to be outdated in like a week or two weeks or three weeks in terms of the hardware the software they can update over the air but it's just something to consider when you're talking about these vehicles here i I understand that vehicles depreciate. I totally get that. But uh, Tesla is unique in their business practices. And it is something that you kind of want to be aware of if you're entering into the market of buying a brand new Tesla. All right, so in closing on the vehicle, what do I think of it? I think the Model X is probably the most peaceful and comfortable vehicle that can be purchased. I think it's probably one of the finest daily drivers that you can buy just in 2023. And there's a lot of um, characteristics of the vehicle that kind of add up to being that and some of them are well you can plug the vehicle in at night and in the morning you wake up and you've got a full charge not having to go to the gas station not having to get the vehicle maintained and get your oil changes and get your timing belts changed and all that kind of stuff the teslas in general i think are the best daily drivers but i think this is probably the best of all of them and it's just because well you've got that thousand horsepower to where you can access that speed anytime you want if you just want to have a little bit of a thrill um, i will say the speed is something that you do get used to over time it's not like, you know, you get the vehicle and it's really fun at first, but then you get used to the speed and the Teslas are relatively sterile. So I wouldn't say this one in particular is an overly fun vehicle to drive. It is a good vehicle to drive. It's a very fun, or I'm sorry, it's not fun, but it's a very good vehicle to drive. It's a very practical vehicle to drive, but it's not overly fun, if that makes sense. Uh, whereas my S Plaid was a fun vehicle, kind of all the way through. That was a fun vehicle to drive. And I think it's just because that one um, was maybe just a little bit more sporty. So there's that. Um, 
Now, again, in terms of the actual vehicle itself, would I buy one again? Probably not, but it's just because I need more cargo space and I don't like that you put those seats down and stuff goes flying forward. I'm not a big fan of that. That's kind of my biggest gripe. Everything else, like the auto doors, kind of annoying me when I get out and um, the yoke and stuff like that, I can kind of get over all that stuff. Uh, but it's mainly just the cargo space for me specifically. Like I said, I think it's an incredible, fantastic vehicle. What other vehicle do you get where you can seat six people, you got a thousand horsepower, you can go sub 10 seconds on the quarter mile down the drag strip, and it's reliable. You can just take it out on the street then and you don't have any sort of maintenance or anything. It's an incredible vehicle and I highly recommend that you buy one. All I'll say is be careful on the resale side and I would buy one used if the used car market isn't insane by the time you're watching this vehicle. If you like this kind of content, please go ahead and give me a like, give me a sub. As always, I appreciate it big time. If you have any sort of questions about the vehicle, please go ahead and comment in the uh, comment section down below. And if there's something that I glossed over and I didn't really hit on in terms of just the vehicle itself, feel free to add that in the comment section down below. And I, I think others uh, would appreciate that. So that's pretty much it, guys. We will see you in the next one.